Good morning, Moosehorn friends. It's good to be back with you by way of uh, video to present to you the message from God's Word today. Uh, we keep you in prayers, and uh, I trust that the Lord has given you a good week um, in serving Him. I want to return to the theme of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, because it is such a rich and full subject that it's shame a shame that uh, it often just gets relegated to Easter Sundays. And I suspect that since we don't spend a lot of time on the subject of the resurrection, that we can often um, miss out on so much of the richness of what it signifies in our lives. For example, um, I think our tendency when talking about the resurrection is to speak only in terms of going to heaven and uh, having eternal life. Now, going to heaven, of course, is a, a, a wonderful thing from God, and eternal life is our ultimate destiny, of course. But I think in our understanding of the resurrection, we often think of it only in terms of going to heaven, which is where Christ is reigning, rather than understanding and appreciating the, the glorious fact that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Now, that was at the heart of the message I presented with you on Easter Sunday, that the resurrection we hope for is a bodily resurrection. And yet, I think for a great many Christians, they can't get their head uh, around that idea very effectively. They have really embraced a rather pagan notion of some sort of spiritual afterlife life existence in some sort of ethereal spiritual place. But the Bible actually speaks of Christ as having raised from the dead such that he invited people to touch him. He said, look, ghosts don't have uh, flesh and bones, as you see that I have. He sat down to meal with his disciples on at least two occasions that we hear about. Uh, the women were able to hold on to his feet, and uh, the tomb was empty. And so this is our hope, too, that we will be raised as Christ is raised. That after we die, there is a temporary period of time when our spirits go to be in heaven with a God, but we await the day of glorious resurrection when Paul say, says, uh, we shall be clothed like him. And so we don't look for an eternal existence in heaven. We look for a new heaven and a new earth where we shall take up our responsibilities as God's image bearers in, in God's creation. And uh, people will be huggable and we eat and we work and uh, we uh, live in, in many ways uh, similar to what we enjoy and understand from our life today. And so that's part of the resurrection. Another aspect of the resurrection, though, that I don't think we think about terribly much is the fact that the resurrection demonstrates that Jesus Christ is Messiah. And this has huge implications, both for Jews and for Gentiles. You recall that Pilate had a sign put over Jesus on his cross saying, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And uh, his questioners, his accusers, boldly cried out to Pilate in the midst of the trial, we have no king but Caesar. And, uh, and here's Jesus who lays down his life in such a horrible, humiliating way from earthly perspective, with a sign that almost mocks him, king of the Jews, in his suffering and death. But through his resurrection, he is raised to everlasting life and seated at the right hand of the Father, showing that he indeed is Messiah of the Jewish people. And that is why uh, the apostles were so eager in their preaching to declare to the Jewish people that the Jesus that they had crucified was in fact the anointed one, the Messiah of God, and called them to repent and put their trust in Jesus. Implications are also there for we Gentiles, because since Jesus is Messiah of the Jews first, brings salvation to the Jews first, we ought to be very, very guarded um, in any temptation to 
bring persecution or to speak ill of the Jewish people and of the Jewish state. We need to be humbly watchful of knowing that God has still preserved a remnant. He's going to raise up a large number of remnant believers from among the Jews who will become part of the, God, of the Christian family and uh, indeed fully our brothers and sisters. So these are a couple of things from the resurrection. But today I want to think about the subject that the resurrection declares that Jesus is Lord. And to begin that thought, uh, I, I draw your attention to Romans chapter 1 and uh, verse 1, where I begin to read, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in his holy scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, Messiah, and was declared to be son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. Jesus is Lord, and this is a very important um, aspect of the resurrection. It proves and demonstrates that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, of course, in his earthly ministry, he had proven that so many different ways and, and different times, didn't he? In uh, being able to bring healing to those who were sick, even the restoration of, of sight to the blind. Um, it showed his power over illness. We see his power over demons, or he casts demons out of uh, people who had become controlled and oppressed by these evil spirits. And the demons themselves trembled before Jesus, fearing that he was going to be the one who would bring judgment upon the, uh, the powers of spiritual darkness. They recognized him for that. He shows that he is Lord and the power that he had over nature, turning water into wine, silencing the storm. And then he showed that he was also the Lord of all life by raising the dead back to life. On several different occasions, very uh, most prominently, the account of Lazarus being raised from, the, from, uh, from death. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so no cross, no grave could hold him down. The authorities ruled against him, condemned him, did all that they could and brought his body to death, sealed him in a tomb with a, a guard and to assure that there would no mischief be done. And on the third day, the first uh, early in the morning on the first day of the week, Jesus as Lord rose from the dead. Jesus is Lord. Now that is the a phrase that is like a creedal statement we find in the scriptures, perhaps the earliest creedal statement that we have in the scriptures. Jesus is Lord. I'd like first to think a little bit about the meaning of that and what time we have left over. And um, we'll just uh, do what we can with the, with the time that we have. But I think of different uh, things about this declaration, Jesus is Lord. First, I, I think of it as an early declaration. This is one of the, like I said, the perhaps the earliest creedal statement of, uh, of the Christian church. It was also a public declaration. It wasn't something, it was just a private feeling that stayed in the inside, but it's something that was publicly expressed. It was a, um, a costly declaration. Since it was a declaration made boldly and in public in the, co in the context of the Roman Empire, for a person to declare, to declare Jesus is Lord brought them into uh, stark contrast with those who would affirm Caesar as Lord. I'll have more to say that in a few minutes. It was a, uh, a personal declaration. That means it was something that you declared based on your own personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a communal declaration that when you made that declaration, you were sharing a common faith 
with all others who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a um, practical declaration. It wasn't just words that were said, but it had meaning for the, uh, the living of one's entire life, that by declaring Jesus as Lord, you are stating that he is going to be the one who is sovereign over every detail of your life, the decisions you make, the path you would take. And uh, it's also a summoning declaration. Jesus as Lord is not only a personal affirmation of faith, but it is a, an authoritative summons to the nations of the world to come and bow down to, the, to Jesus Christ, who is the Lord over all lords, the King over all kings. So let's uh, work through some of that in the time that I have. And so let's go back to looking at how this is um, an early declaration of the church, an early declaration of the church. Now we see that in the book of Romans in a very uh, well-known portion of scripture in Romans chapter 10. In Romans uh, chapter 10 and verse 9, we find uh, these words. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'll read that again. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, in the background of these words and the way that these words would uh, echo through the church and grip people's hearts, have, uh, keep in mind the fact that when uh, Caesars were put in the position of authority that they would have in Rome, there would be a big public festival. And as the Caesar, new Caesar, was uh, climbing the steps to the seat of authority, the people shout, shouting would say, Caesar is God. Caesar is Lord. And so this was a uh, part of the, the predominant culture during the time when Paul is writing. And it's uh, quite striking, isn't it, that when Paul is writing these words, he's writing to Christians in Rome. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. From time to time, down through the course of various Caesars, especially in the early centuries of, uh, of this century before uh, Rome became predominantly Christian, from time to time, uh, statues of the Caesar would be brought to the outlying towns and cities of the empire. And there would be a big festival called and feasts would be held and enjoyed. And the people would be required to come and offer a pinch of incense on an altar before the statue and declare Caesar as Lord, to declare and swear their obedience to Caesar. Now, from much of these, many of these occasions, and for a long period of time, the Jews were given exemption from having to make that declaration. Romans knew that they couldn't swear obedience to any other God or any other Lord besides Yahweh. But the Christians were, um, came to the point where they were being excluded by the Jews from recognition as part of their, their group. And they didn't fall under that protection. And so Christians would often be put on the spot as far as uh, having to make this declaration. And we'll, I'll say more about that um, in, in just a little bit. So here we have, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Um, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find another reference to this uh, creedal statement. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and uh, verse 3. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And again, we have in the background of this that it was very costly for people on a public basis to say Jesus is Lord as opposed to Caesar is Lord. I heard the story of a missionary, I think it was in India, 
who uh, was being uh, mocked, as it were, by one who wouldn't believe the message of the gospel. And he made reference to the verse I just mentioned, that no one by the Spirit of God can ever say Jesus is Lord, uh, except by the Spirit of God. Um, and uh, so the, they were in a busy train uh, station, and the missionary was uh, getting ready to, to climb on board the train to depart. And uh, this uh, mocking friend of his said, well, the Bible says that no one can say except by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is Lord. And the missionary said, yes, that's right. And the grin came across the man's face and he said, well, Jesus is Lord. And uh, the missionary pausing for a moment. And as the people are pressing now to come into the train car, he says, now turn around and say that to them. Of course, he wouldn't do it. And that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about this profession of faith that makes a difference before the eyes of, of others. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Another passage, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus Christ, for Jesus' sake. And so uh, Jesus as Lord is at the heart of the declaration, the apostolic declaration. And we hear, and as we study the sermons of the apostles, it's uh, often around the whole events of the resurrection of Jesus and proving that Jesus is indeed Lord. And then finally, uh, Philippians chapter 2, which is, a again, a familiar passage of Scripture, um, perhaps a, an old hymn of the church that Paul had come to know and recorded as part of his epistle. But uh, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, this is that passage with which says, have this mind among you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was form, in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, born in likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And then the resurrection is referred to. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, bestowed at him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so we find this anticipation of the day when all creation and every uh, person will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, something that's useful here, I think, is to take a look at, at um, an Old Testament scripture passage that inspired this uh, passage here in Philippians. So if you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 45. And the reason I'm doing this is to point out the great significance of the title Lord being given to Jesus. Lord, in the uh, New Testament, it's, it's a Greek word, kurios which can mean somebody who is of noble position, somebody who is of superior standing and, and higher uh, status and authority in, in, uh, in life. And so you call this person Lord. However, uh, one or 200 years before the time of Jesus, the Jewish scholars translated the Hebrew Bible over into Greek. And because they were so careful to uh, protect the name of God, Yahweh, from being abused, mis misused. In translating the Hebrew text into Greek, instead of writing those letters that we would understand to be Yahweh, the name of God, they substituted in their English translations the Greek word kurios, Lord. And so when Jesus declared, uh, was declared to be Lord, for those who are of Jewish uh, descent and uh, background, they would recognize they're saying something much bigger than just saying he's, he's a boss. But rather they are saying that Jesus is Lord Yahweh. And much could be said about that. But take a look at Isaiah 45 and uh, listen to what it says here. Uh, 45 verse 20, 
Assemble yourselves, come together, draw near, you, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord, Yahweh? And there is no other God beside me, a righteous God, a Savior. There is none beside me. Turn to me, be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, for my mouth has gone out into uh, gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess allegiance. Only in the Lord, Yahweh, it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. Goes on to say, in the Lord, all offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. So here is a passage in the Old Testament where Yahweh is speaking as being the only Savior of the world, who also speaks of how to me every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And so this is the idea that Paul is picking up here, uh, or the song is picking up here, that it's a recognition that Jesus, who rose from the dead, is himself Yahweh, and that he is truly Lord. So it's an early declaration of the Christian church of their faith in God. Now, it was also a public declaration. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so from the earliest practices of the Christian church, uh, embracing something of the uh, ritual bath that the Jews practiced um, commonly in the Old Covenant, uh, God, Jesus embraced this practice of baptism to be a way for the new believer to publicly profess and declare their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this was a, a public declaration. It wasn't to be kept private at all. And in a world like those uh, that in which the Christians lived in the days of Paul, it, it was uh, quite a significant thing to make this kind of declaration. Now, for some generations, it was for us a tradition that we did, and uh, it wasn't costly, it wasn't a difficult thing at all. But in the days of the early church, to say that Jesus is Lord not only risked being uh, cast out and disowned by your own family, but it also risked uh, you're coming underneath the wrath of the governing authorities of the Roman Empire. And today this is happening as well. Or a public profession of faith in a place like North Korea, in some situations in the Muslim world, even in Israel, it can be very, very costly for an individual taking such a step. Persecution of, Jesus, of the Christian church today is seeing the martyrdom of more Christians than ever before. And it's because they dare publicly to, to declare Jesus as Lord as opposed to the other lords of the earth. And that means that it's also a costly declaration. I wonder if it's cost you anything to be a professor of Jesus Christ as Lord. Has it cost you um, respect with your family or friends? Have you uh, missed out on a promotion because of it? Have you... Um, been docked grades in your schoolwork, should it ever emerge that you consider Jesus Christ to be Lord. And I think the time is coming when, uh, even in Canada, it's going to be a costly thing for us publicly to be Christian people. It seems to me that in North America these days, with much that's going on politically and socially, that uh, there is a determined effort to go after the Christian church. Why? Because the Christian church is a, is a danger to people who want to have authority over our lives to tell us what is true and what is good and what is real. And when, when, when we have a Lord who is above all the lords, we declare Jesus as Lord and we uphold his revealed truth in the scriptures as being the uh, established reality, that is a threat to those that are trying to turn our world upside down. Now, I think we're going to see more and more ways that uh, being a public Christian is going to be costly for us. And perhaps you can think of ways that this is already underway. 
So it's an early declaration, a public declaration. It's a costly declaration. It's a practical declaration. And saying that Jesus is Lord, uh, it ought to make a difference in the way we conduct our lives, the way we do our business serving other people, the way we handle our finances, the way that we speak to and of other people, the way that we care for the poor and needy and vulnerable of society, the way we live our lives with regard to the shifting uh, moral values. And are we uh, those that, because Jesus is Lord, are our lives marked by holiness and purity? Uh, these are all different ways that uh, saying Jesus is Lord ought to set us apart uh, from, from other people. So it is a practical uh, thing to say Jesus is Lord. It's, uh, it makes me think of the Christian bumper stickers, you know, with the ichthus or Jesus is Lord or Jesus saves that some people might put on their vehicles. And I often think, boy, they're gutsy to have that on their car because I imagine the time when I do something stupid, I'm distracted or maybe I'm speeding or whatever. And I'm thinking I wouldn't want to dishonor Jesus by having his name attached to my car and my driving. But I wonder if what would happen if we had Jesus attached to our foreheads. Everybody saw it. They knew that we were followers of the Lord Jesus. How would that um, change our, our behavior and our conduct with other people? And so it's also a, um, a community declaration. You see, the courage of one person declaring Jesus as Lord, uh, and even a great cost, as it stands out in, in view of other people, is an encouragement to our the fellow Christians around us. Let's face it, we are all by times timid, compromised in our Christian life. We come into situations where you might want to just hide the fact, pretend that you uh, are really not a Christian at all, or not one of those kind of Christians. And uh, you know, you just don't want to be obvious. And what we end up with is a whole lot of people who, in their hearts, believe Jesus was raised from the dead, and maybe in little some quiet private moments say Jesus is Lord, but in the course of their lives, their lives do not broadcast that Jesus is Lord. But when one Christian dares to stand up in their obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, it has an encouraging effect on all of those around them. Maybe we can think of by way of example the, the the uh, times that we struggled through with, with COVID. And there are Christians who took stands around some of the policies and some of the uh, edicts that the government was handing down. And some of us were really rather uh, distressed by that because of what we were hearing and that these measures were necessary for safety. But I think others were maybe distressed by that because they thought, well, these people are just going to come across as being obnoxious and holier than thou and, and uh, will dishonor the gospel. But, you know, I think that for some of us, at least, <laughs> seeing the example of these men and women who held fast to their commitment to worship and prayer and the declaration of Jesus as Lord and trusting in him above all, even in the time of COVID, that that was an encouragement to many of us to stand firm for the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And so there is a great benefit, not just personally, but to others, when we acknowledge Jesus as Lord and declare it so uh, in, a, in a public way. And uh, I guess the last thing I want to mention is that this is a, a summoning declaration. It's a summoning declaration. Declaration is that Jesus is Lord, and therefore you had better bow. Remember Philippians, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, All authorities in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. And here is the challenge for us today. We have a message of good news. It is not just about personal salvation and going to heaven so we can live with the angels. But the good news is that Jesus Christ conquered death and sin and Satan and is now Lord and King of the universe. And he is going, he has come to claim us for himself and he's going to make all things new. And he shall reign from sea and to sea and to sea and all of cre creation and heaven and earth will bow before him. And so we as Christians are called to declare to our family members, to our 
neighbors and friends to even hold our governments to account and be unashamed by saying Jesus is Lord. We say to our governments, you can't claim lordship. You cannot claim our ultimate loyalty. You not, cannot claim uh, our worship and, and adulation uh, because there is one who is much, much higher than you. Jesus is Lord. And we can call our governments and the nations of the world to repent and put their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved. It's a lot of controversy today around something called Christian nationalism. I don't know if some of you have run across that and um, even evangelical churches are arguing about this, this consideration. What is Christian nationalism? Well, Christian nationalism is the idea that the nation belongs to Jesus. And the question then becomes, how do we work this out? And I think the fear of many people in society who are uh, just terrified of the notion of Christian nationalism is that somehow uh, Christians are going to seize, seize power and use the power of courts and law and uh, law enforcement and so on to compel people to do things that they don't want to do, to worship a God they don't believe in, to uh, restrict their decisions of life. To, to follow the rules and regulations of uh, this small group of religious zealots. And they're, they're quite worried about that. But I think something that we ought to prayerfully consider is the fact that Jesus Christ is claiming lordship of every nation. He's calling all peoples to repent and follow him. He's calling on every ruler and president and king and queen, every council, every parliament to bow before him as Lord, and that would have implications. And certainly, if we are going to have a Christian nation, it can only come, it will only come at least peacefully, as people bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he is Lord and Savior, that they would repent from their sins and put their trust in him and follow him, declaring him to be Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. And it's only as people and large numbers respond to the call of the of the gospel as the Holy Spirit accompanies the preaching of faithful Christian witnesses, that the tone and the health of a nation will be transformed because the um, the populace will, of their own faith, acknowledge Jesus as Lord, and then the nation will become a Christian nation. It's an interesting thing for us to ponder of all what that would look like. And it's a challenge for us in the meantime, when we are a minority, to think about how do I live my Christian life today in view of the fact that we have a government that is really anti-Christ in many, so many ways in their policies. And yet we are called to live that Jesus Christ is Lord over all lords, and yet to be faithful and good citizens of our land as, as God enables us. So a couple of images I want to leave with us this morning. First of all is uh, Thomas, remember in the upper room? In the upper room, Thomas is just totally uh, disheartened because uh, his master, uh, Jesus, had been tortured and uh, betrayed and crucified, dead and buried. And he couldn't bring himself to believe the glad reports of the women and of the other disciples that Jesus Christ was alive. He was so brokenhearted and distressed. And Jesus in his kindness appeared for him before him bodily, inviting him to touch his body and remember uh, Thomas's profession, my Lord and my God. That is our profession too. And then I want to turn to a man named uh, Polycar, who was a disciple of John the Apostle. So he's an apostolic father and one of the early recorded um, martyrs of the Christian church outside of the Bible. And we uh, are given the scene where Polycar, an 86-year-old man, has been brought under arrest, and he's refusing to bow before Caesar. And uh, we have this scene. As Polycar entered the arena, a voice was heard from heaven, Be strong, Polycar, and act manfully. Nobody saw the speaker, but those of our, of our people who were present heard the voice. And when he was finally led up to the tribunal, there was a terrific uproar among the people on hearing that Polycar has been arrested. So when they had led him up, the proconsul questioned him whether he was Polycar, and when he admitted the fact, tried to persuade him to deny the faith. 
He said, respect your age and all the rest. They were accustomed to say, swear by the fortune of Caesar. Change your mind. Say away with the atheists, because Christians were considered atheists in the day. They didn't acknowledge Caesar as God. They didn't acknowledge the Roman gods at all. And so they were considered atheists. But Polycar looked with a stern mien at the whole rabble of lawless heathen in the arena. And then he groaned and looked up to heaven and said with a wave of his hand pointing to all the people in the crowd, away with the atheists. And the proconsul insisted and said, take the oath, I will set you free. Revile Christ. And Polycar replied, for six and eighty years I have been serving him and he has done me no wrong. How then dare I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And there are many countless Christian martyrs, men and women, young and old, who have refused to deny the Savior and have gone to their death because they acknowledge Jesus is Lord. What about you? Have you professed Jesus as Lord? Do you profess him as Lord day to day in your life for your friends and family in the community? It begins with coming to personal belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and so following him through the waters of baptism. Through baptism, we profess publicly our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also means that in our day-to-day -day life, in the course of going to school and doing our jobs, working with our neighbors, voting at uh, election season, living our lives in service of others, joining a church family, being part of a church fellowship where we want to put Jesus first in everything. We publicly declare Jesus as Lord. And if you haven't done that, you're not saved. Isn't that what is implied? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's incumbent to make sure that our Christian faith in the gospel is far more than just a private feeling or a wish. But it's a declaration that Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, is also king of the universe. He is my king, my Lord, and I will follow him. I invite you to follow Jesus, to follow him with every ounce of your life, and that you would openly and publicly declare him to be Lord as you live for him and serve him. Someday we are going to see him face to face. And those who have been faithful to him will hear his voice say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we recognize that uh, you are the king of the universe. And as we see God enthroned, we see at the right hand our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, one who is highly exalted, preparing to come and claim everything for himself. We look forward to being able to someday in person declare him to be Lord and King of kings and Lord of lords. Until then, may our lives show forth, Lord, our, con our conviction that Jesus is indeed Lord and God that we would not compromise, that we would be bold, and, and that we would um, show forth to the world and for the sake of our brothers and sisters what it is to have a courageous faith. In so doing, may we have the love of Jesus for the lost. May we have the willingness to follow the Holy Spirit in our lives and the determination to obey the words of Jesus, the scriptures, as you uh, bring them to bear into us, into our lives. So please bless this church and bless each one of us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, thank you once again for this opportunity. Lord bless you all. I'll see you in a couple of weeks.